Unfortunately, this week, we don't have Marion Calder with us as she's on holiday. Hi, everyone. So welcome back to the Cauldron. And it's been a busy week for women's rights this week, I think you'll all agree. And actually a very shocking and tragic week when we look at male violence against women and the rather weak response of society to it. So, Lisa, how has been your week been this week? Hi, Denise. My week has been quite interesting. Um, I was quite alarmed by Scottish government bragging that Scotland is the first country in the world to indoctrinate children because they have embedded LGBT inclusion in the curriculum. Uh, obviously, I was sad to hear about the Sarah Everard thing as well. Um, I'm glad, obviously, Cousins has managed to get a full life sentence, but what he's done and what her family had to endure in that courtroom, a life sentence is just not going to cut it for her poor family. I think it's interesting that the Scottish government focus on trans inclusion education and um, they don't really have any plan or goal or idea that they might like to try and educate boys not to be violent against women. And um, Claire, how's your week been this week? One thing I want to say is currently on Reddit, there are 16,000 detransitioner stories on there. Now that's 16,000 young people who've been obviously groomed as children, who've gone through horrific surgeries um, on their genitals, on their breasts, um, just on their bodies, you know, and there 16,000 have now detransitioned on Reddit alone. And you can go on there and read those stories. 35,000 women um, on GoFundMe trying to raise money to have their breasts amputated. I've been, as I've been trying to um, find out more about what these actual surgeries involve, I've followed a really excellent um, YouTuber. She's called X Ulanzic, which is a really unusual name, but she does some amazing um, commentaries on videos that children who are going through these surgeries post up and she basically breaks them down and um, they call them transgender journeys um, now there's one in particular there's a youtuber called i think it's her well it's a woman but she transitioned to a man called gruffin now that person is currently 20 years old and has spent a one million dollars since the age of 10 on surgeries and they have completely ruined their body. You know, she's had life-saving um, surgeries at times because of various infections, UTI issues, you know, still doesn't have a working phallus. Not that you would ever be, you know, she can't even um, go to the bathroom, you know. I would love to know what the figures are on these children who have, um, what are those things called, catheters. Because in XU Lanzik's videos, I am not joking on all of those kids. They've got catheters. You know, there's young people trying to transition to the opposite sex, ruining their bodies. You know, she talks a lot about the complications. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's not something that's not likely to happen. This is very, very common, yeah? There's always complications, like they've got bacterial infections, necrosis. So the skin, obviously, if it's having problems with bacteria, that skin actually just deteriorates and, and becomes infected and then it has to be cut away because it's, it's dead. No sexual function and I mean, it, I just can't even believe that this is sanctioned and it's a thing. Um, and actually I was watching more episodes of I Am Jazz. And one of the options there um, to create the skin, which would, would be required. Now Jazz went on puberty blockers. I found this out, puberty blockers at 11 and went on estrogen at 12. You know, I don't know how that, how that boy's health is going to be uh, long term. But one of the options that he didn't go for, which maybe he should have done, was called a tissue expander. And this is what they're doing to kids. 
And that is basically a little balloon is put inside the, um, the scrotum. And that is, in, it, it expands basically, they inject water into it. And that grows and grows and that tissue um, obviously stretches. Um, and it, you can't really walk about or anything. Apparently it gets to the size of, of a grapefruit and it's incredibly uncomfortable and, and painful. And I could see that Jazz was really worried about that when the doctors were talking about it. And that has to be injected, as I say, once a week uh, with water, which is through the scrotum, a hole in the scrotum, and that would be really, really painful. That skin can then be used to create this vagina, but that's when I was talking last week about having to have electrolysis to have that hair removed. But this exulanzic was talking about, about bacteria. Now, even if that hair's removed from the bollocks, those follicles, the holes remain, and they are breeding grounds for bacteria. And this is why using that can be problematic and often is. There was another option though, option two, was when the perineum, I hope I've pronounced that right, skin from inside the body, which is hairless, it's a similar color. Um, it does secrete because obviously it's inside the body and it's used to water. Um, they actually use that skin and I, I believe that's what they did for Jazz, along with the small amount of, of penis that he had. But I mean, that's, it's, it's experimental surgery. But you know, I put something up on um, the Cauldron's um, Twitter account last week, and I actually said that it was e experimental and someone pulled me up on it. And quite rightly, when I, when I read it, because experiments actually, are measured, aren't they? And they're not measuring any of these, you know, we've no figures on what's happening to these children post-surgery. And, you know, some of them are having, I mean, some of these children had up to 10 surgeries. I mean, to me, there's nothing wrong with being gender non-conforming and Jazz Jennings, a perfect example of a really beautiful young gay boy whose parents probably just couldn't cope with the fact that he was gay. There's a few things like that's been happening this week. Some of it's good, which is the latest from the Sports Council. And they've admitted, you know, that it's not possible to have um, so safety. Safety, this is important one, and fairness, if they include trans women in women's sport. And they've given the other sports a choice. One of them is trans inclusive sport. So just to continue to allow biological males to compete in women's categories, although it's not fair and it's not safe, which is prioritizing trans inclusion above women's safety. Now, does anybody think that's reasonable? Or is that just typical of where we are in the debate today, where women's safety is not important? You know, that just shocks me. And the fact that this has been welcomed, has been welcomed by many people saying this is great, has been welcomed because it comes from the position of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an improvement of the previous position position but nobody should welcome a report that says you're allowed to prioritize trans inclusion above women's safety and that kind of sums up the entire gender ideological debate where trans inclusion is being prioritized over the safety of women and girls and the other thing they say you can then organize the sport with two categories female and open this seems to be very sensible. And then the other is um, unisex, which is just ridiculous. It's like change the rules of sport to make it fairer <laughs> so that women can compete. And so that was my sport one this week. And then, of course, we have had the politics. So the, the Labour Party have got themselves into, you know, a, a bit of a a mess really on women's rights. They have gone down the trans women are women, trans men are men, and this leads, leads them into ridiculous positions. Now, one thing I want to make absolutely clear, you don't have to believe that a trans woman is a, is a woman or a trans man is a man 
to protect trans rights or to ensure trans people have, are not discriminated against and they have rights. When people are asked about women's rights or impacts on women's rights, they never talk about women's rights. They talk about trans rights. And that's why they get into this mess, because once they <laughs> sold you this story, this mantra, and that they believe, then when they get asked, okay, does only women have cervix? Then you get the situation where Emily Thornby has no, no alternative but to say no to that question. It's not just women that have cervix, because trans men can have cervixes because they're men and they're men with cervixes. So that's why they get into a ridiculous position because they started off with a lie, with two lies, and they keep having to try and justify their lie. And because it's a lie, it can be backed up by fact, and they just get into more and more ridiculous discussions. That's what this debate has got to, it's got to absurdities. Shiro of the week is in Bronwyn Davis. Bronwyn Davis has stood in front of the Labour Party delegates. Over the past year, one of our women MPs has been subjected to a vile campaign of abuse. I stand with Rosie Duffield and... And I will defend to the death her right to express her views without being subjected to a torrent yeah. of misogynist De abuse. Delegate, that's time. Which was like incredibly brief, and she got cheers as well as booze. So, um, Lisa, what other things have been happening to you this week? Um, actually, Denise, with you saying that things have been quite absurd, I just wanted to touch upon Stonewall. They now want everyone to be invited for smear tests, so that's us three and men because they don't record sex on medical records anymore, they record gender and they can't always see if there's a little F marked on your medical file, so now they're inviting everyone for smear tests. Um, going back to what I was saying about the Scottish Government bragging about um, indoctrinating our children, I think that we should be teaching children it's okay not to be gender non-conforming. I think this kind of worries me, being a girl and obviously seeing young girls at school, all girls want to be really skinny and really pretty and obviously a lot of girls end up anorexic and we're not affirming this. We would never affirm somebody and say, oh, you look so good, so skinny, don't eat anymore. That is a mental health condition and if I had a daughter or even one of my sons, if they came to me and they were conscious of their weight and they were always trying to lose weight and taking laxatives, I would not buy into that. I would not indulge onto their fantasy that they were fat. I would get them the help they needed. So why is this gender issue so different? It's still a mental health condition. And I've been looking this week at a detransitioner, um, Walt Hare. I heard him speaking on the Neil Boylan show um, a couple of months ago. Now he actually, I won't go too much into it just now, we can come back to it, but he lived as a woman for eight years and then he transitioned back to a man. Now he said that he was forced to wear a dress as a child by a relative that sexually abused him and he said that he puts that sexual abuse and the fact he was forced to wear a dress, he puts that down to his gender dysphoria. Now I wonder how many children are gender dysphoric that have been through childhood abuse. Somebody had put on social media and said that you know they got their they caught their child trying to chop off his willy and so clearly as a young child of four year old so clearly he was trans and was actually a girl but the so psychologist child psychologist will tell you any child that tries to mutilate his genitals or her genitals is a real sign is a real red flag and is a real sign of abuse so instead of actually finding out these root causes and what abuse has may have gone on instead they trans children so in um, clear you'd had a few words to say about our labor politicians and their ignorance of women's biology <laughs> yes um so i mean I, for me the, the one thing is truth deserves respect in my view now the truth is that women exist and 
we are very, you know, separate, we're very distinct to men, you know, we have different bodies set, there's only two sexes, male and female. Um, now, India Willoughby is a man who has basically had cosmetic surgery to create a neo vagina. It's not real and, you know, it's cosmetic. Um, I mean, there's just zero chance of a cervix being anywhere near that cavity. I mean, it's an impossibility. No man in the history of the world has ever had or will have a cervix. And the Labour Party have shown themselves this week to be complete and utter Muppets. David Lammy, I mean, Jesus. David Lammy thinks a trans woman can actually have a cervix that they somehow magically grow on the unicorn tree. Uh, Keir Starmer says it shouldn't be said that only women have a cervix. And then various other um, entities in uh, the Labour Party have said the same thing. And what I want to know is who can women vote for these days? Because that list is diminishing day by day as we have politicians woke politicians falling over themselves to deny the reality of women. I am not a belief. My body is not a belief. I don't actually have a cervix anymore. I don't actually have breasts anymore. That's my lived experience, but I'm still a woman, okay? I can speak with absolute authority of the pain and suffering that surgeries like double mastectomies and radical hysterectomies have on the body. And that's a grown woman, me, who did this for you know, health reasons. And we're doing this to young children. By the age of 20, no sexual function whatsoever. You know, how, that, it's obscene. I, 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 I don't understand how, how this is just not, we should be rioting in the streets about what they're doing to our kids. It's just all wrong. Women is not our performance, you know. This poor girl, um, Sarah Everard, who was murdered by a police officer, you know, all I think about now is that guy could tomorrow declare that he's a woman and there's nothing that we can do to stop that man being put into prison beside very, very vulnerable women. So when you say about the politicians, so Sajik Javid, um, who is, I think he's a Tory, he, I think he's health secretary. Yeah, he is health secretary in the Tories. And he comes on to Twitter and he makes fun, it says about David Lammy, oh, you know, the Labour Party, they want to run the health service and they don't even know that women, you know, have cervixes. But the thing is, the Conservatives can't get away with this. They've been in power for the ten, the decade, really, that this dangerous ideology has taken hold. And I'm sure they're they're looking with smiles at what's happening to Labour, and maybe you know they have realised their mistakes. And as for you know our government in Scotland, well, they are like one of the worst governments. And just this week. Professor Dame Anne Glover, who was the first scientific advisor to the Scottish Government, says that First Minister Nicola Sturgeon is wrong to ignore the science on gender identity, that sex is binary and that the effects on women and on women's psychology shouldn't be ignored. So maybe Nicola Sturgeon will pay attention to her, that I don't have high hopes. Um, I do have more to say about this week. One of the things that actually really alarmed me this week was how confident David Lammy was when he said that a man could also grow a cervix. Uh, it was like he thought the more confident he sounded, the more it was going to be true. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I was really alarmed by that actually. The saddest thing this week with the Sarah Everard um, trial and conviction and sentencing um, was at the same time Sabina Nessa's murderer, alleged murderer, was in the same court building. The reaction of the politicians has been woefully inadequate. I mean, Cressida Dick, she should 
she should be sacked. She shouldn't be asked to resign. She should be sacked. She employed a murderer. And this man had a dubious, dubious past because, you know, he had been known uh, for exposing himself. So she employed a man and he, he was given a, a, a senior role in the police, you know, and his <laughs> friends in the police nicknamed him the rapist. This is the culture that Cressida Dick presides over. And now that woman should not be in a job, but did they sack her? No, they gave her an, another two years. That's how little women matter. And when they look at lessons to be learned, is there a lesson we need to put psychological evaluations into the men, into police officers? We need to look for early signs, you know, like flashing and get them out of the police force. If somebody's nicknamed a rapist, him and everybody else is calling him a rapist should be sacked from the police force. Is that the lessons they've learned? No, that's not the lessons they've learned. The lessons they've learned from this is that women should flag down a bus if we have doubts and maybe we should resist arrest because that's going to work out really well for us, re resisting arrest. So that is quite shocking. And again, it just goes into the list of things that women are getting treated really, really badly. And our safety is just not a priority. There's been 80 women murdered by men since Sarah Everard was murdered. And it is a male violence against women. And although obviously women have to, we know that, we, that all women and our daughters have to take precautions, but we also should be thinking about doing something about the cultures in organizations just like the police that seem to happily enable this. And it's not going to help the situation because we know men that start off as, a, as, as exhibitionists and boyers, they move on to other crimes, to sex crimes against women and in extreme cases to mur be murderers. There's a bit of violent por pornography in there and there's also using prostitutes. So if we are now saying that men that are exhibitionists and boyers, they're going to be happily allowed in women's changing rooms and anywhere there's women to flash at them, you know, it's not helping. In a, in, at a time when women, viol, male violence against women is at its height, is, is a real problem for our society, we are giving men easier access to women. Why would you even think that that was a sensible thing to do? Do you not see the connection between the two things? You know, men don't respect women. They are violent towards women. They male power over women, sexual assault of women. And at the same time, you have an ideology that says any man can be a woman. Any man should be allowed to access vulnerable women and children anytime he wants. There's no gatekeeping and that women that speak up and say, no, he shouldn't, are abused and vilified. They're cancelled. They're sacked from their jobs. And <laughs> does people not make the connection here that our culture is an anti-women misogynistic culture? And that's what has to change. I just wanted to jump in quickly, actually, when you were speaking about 80 women since Sarah Everard had been killed. There was actually a woman very local, uh, Benlin Burke, and her daughter, they were killed by a man in Dundee, um, and that was quite horrific, and that was by a man that she thought she could trust. She was living with this man, and it really annoyed me because Nicholas Surgeon said that women are finding more inventive ways to stay safe. Well, women are having to do that because men are finding more inventive ways to get into women's spaces and attack women via self-ID. Now, I said this to Nicola Sturgeon. I said to her it was on her that Scottish women were unsafe and she is yet to respond to me, but she has to eat that. She has to accept that she is endangering women. Any final words from you, Claire? 
Yeah, I mean, Lisa, that is just bang on. And I mean, I was basically thinking, you know, any politician that's talking about protecting women and women's rights, I'm automatically skeptical these days because I want that. I want that particular politician to define what they mean by woman because that isn't actually guaranteed anymore. To me, a woman is an adult human female. We're all women, yeah. With self-ID um, and the way things are at the moment, where can women find any refuge from men? You know, where can we find any um, spaces that are just for us? David Lammy, and, um, he said on, I think it was Radio 5, BBC 5, he said that um, this issue with services and women's rights, etc. He said that was not an issue that had ever come up on the doorstep. And that's a, that is a barefaced lie because a woman who canvassed with him, um, Annie McDonald, came on Twitter and said that was categorically not true and that apparently one woman had been sobbing, um, talking about this issue. She was so worried. And he actually comforted that woman and said, Labour would never let women down. Well, what the hell happened there, David Lammy? Now, I don't want to end on a bad thing this week. So I want to encourage everyone to go on YouTube and um, the New Zealand Selects Committee have been hearing from women this week. And oh my God, some of these women are on fire. Absolutely magnificent. But the best one I heard was a woman called Rex Landy and she tore a strip off them and please if you do anything uh, if you just want to reignite that fire in your stomach about the disgrace that is going on in our worldwide at the moment and the abuse of women please go up I think it was speak up for women New Zealand Rex Landy and please watch her submission to the New Zealand Select Committee and the final laugh from me is that a new, a new Zealand um, university has just awarded um, Hubbard the uh, Sportswoman of the Year. Um, despite the fact that Lisa Carrington, uh, now how many did she get? Three gold um, trophies, um, three gold medals, I beg your pardon, at Tokyo. Uh, she was overlooked and we've got a man who's Sportswoman of the Year. Thanks everyone for joining us, but we're going to end this week on a sober note while we remember the women killed by men since it, Sarah Everard was murdered. Gatika Gagoya, 29 Leicester, found stabbed in the street and died of her injuries on March 4. Imogen Bohazuk, 29, Greater Manchester, fatally stabbed by partner on March 4. Waning Shu, 16, South Wales, killed by pressure to neck at family's Chinese restaurant on March 5. Karen McLean, 50, Northern Ireland, stabbed to death by her son Ken Flanagan on March 19. Cece Nell, 30, Northern Ireland, also fatally stabbed by Flanagan, who then killed himself on March 19. Symmetra Mystery, 32, Leicester, found dead at home on March 23rd. Samantha Matsami Mills, 31, West Yorkshire, killed in suspected arson attack on March 23. Patricia Osley, 66, West Yorkshire, found dead at home on March 25. Phyllis Nelson, 76, East London, found, found dead at home on March 26. Claudia Saltis, 30, Hull, found dead in a house on March 27. Simone Ambler, 49, Blackpool, stabbed to death in a house on March 29. Emma MacArthur, 49, Berkshire, stabbed in the neck and chest and found dead on a road on April 1. Sherry Milne, 51 Weymouth, found stabbed and strangled to death after apparent murder-suicide on April 1. Constance Sabunia, 50 Plumstead, found stabbed to death with scissors at, a ho at home on April 4. 
Jacqueline Grant, 54, Glasgow, found dead at home with multiple knife wounds on April 6. Loretta Herman, 85, Ilford, strangled to death by her son Mark Herman and found at her home on April 9. Egley Van Golan, 34, Suffolk, found dead in a lake on April 9. Sally Metcalf, 68, Suffolk, strangled by husband in apparent murder-suicide on April 10. Sarah Keith, 26, Leeds, stabbed and strangled by partner at home on April 12. Penny Wright, 83, Birmingham, dies jumping out of window after an arson attack on her home on April 18. Charmaine O'Donnell, 25, Helensburg, Scotland, pulled from water on April 23. Michelle Cooper, 40, Essex, died from head injuries on April 23. Kerry Bradford, 57, South Wales, found stabbed to death at home on April 25. Julia James, 53, Kent, found dead with serious head injuries in Woodlands where she was walking her dog on April 27. Beth Aspley, 34, Redden, found dead with blood force injuries to head at home on April 30. Susan Booth, 62 Oldham, found dead with severe head injuries outside a house on May 2nd. Mia Zofakar, 26, strangled and shot after allegedly refusing to marry two love rivals on May 3. Maria Rawlings, 45, Romford, Essex, found dead in bushes after walking home from hospital on May 4. Shanice Gregory, 29, Harrogate, North Yorkshire, killed by boyfriend in hotel in apparent murder-suicide on May 4. Agnes Acom, 20, last seen in Cricklewood, North London on May 9. Her body has not been found. Wendy Cole, 70, St I, stabbed to death at her home on May 10. Char Caroline Crouch, 20, strangled and tortured by husband at their home on May 11. Svetlana McAlee, 53, Ilford, attacked at house and died in hospital five weeks later on May 12. Nicola Kirk, 45, Dumfries, Scotland, hit by a car in alleged attack and died in hospital on May 12. Unnamed 32-year-old woman, Ilford, East London, found dead at home on May 13. Agita Gislier, 61, Barnsley, stabbed at a house and died in hospital on May 26. Five. Lauren Wilson, 34, Renfrew, found stabbed to death on May 26. Pinana Kebiba, 42, Cheam, South London, found dead at home with multiple stab wounds on May 27. Jill Hickory, 82, Cornwall, stabbed to death and found at house on May 29. Bethany Vincent, 26, Lincolnshire, stabbed to death along with her nine-year-old son Darren on May 31. Esther Brown, 67, Glasgow, found dead at her flat on June 1. Michaela Hall, 49, Truro, found dead at a house on June 1. Mildred Whitford, 84, Nuneaton, found dead at her home on June 1. Stacey Clay, 37, Nottingham, found seriously injured in her garden and died in hospital on June 2. Linda Hood, 68, Norfolk, found dead in burning home by firefighters having been strangled to death on June 11. Marlene Coleman, 53, Lewisham, found unresponsive by medics at house and declared dead at the scene on June 16. Sophie Cartledge, 39, Scumford, Scunthorpe, found dead at a home with significant injuries on June 18. Gracie Spinks, 23, Derbyshire, slashed in throat by alleged stalker while tending to her horse on June 18. Kim Dearden, 63, Potter's Bar, Hertfordshire, stabbed to death at a house on June 19. Michelle Hilbert, 29, Basingstoke, found dead alongside her husband on June 19. Sally Poynton, 44, Crowless Cornwall, found stabbed to death at a house on June 22. Catherine Wardleworth, in her 70s, Merseyside, shot dead by husband in apparent murder-suicide on June 23. Sugi Badale, 73, Coventry, found dead alongside her husband in apparent murder-suicide on June 29. Elsie Pinzer, 66, South End, killed in suspected arson attack on June 3. It, Catherine Stewart, 54, Airdrie, found dead at her home on July 4. 
Ishad Ahmed, 52, Nelson Lancashire, beating to death at her home on July 4. Tamara Paddy, 45, Sally Bridge, found stabbed to death in her home on July 7. Katie Kathleen Branken, 37, Northern Ireland, stabbed to death in Glamping site on July 12. Sarah Sandra Hughes, 63, Manchester, killed in house fire on July 13. Beatrice Stoker, 36, East Dulwich, East London, stabbed to death on July 23rd. Pat Patricia Holland, 83, Gorton on Sea, Norfolk, allegedly killed by her lodger and found dead on July 24. Louis, Louise Cam, 71, last seen in Barlet, North London, on July 26. Jordanos Bran, 19, Birmingham, found with multiple stab wounds in a house. Amanda Selby, 15, tall in North Wales, found stabbed to death in a holiday park on July 31. Margaza Legenska, 37, Shipham Northbound, found dead with severe head injury on August 1. Megan Newborough, 23, Woodhouse Eaves, Leicestershire, found dead on Country Lane on August 7. Diane Nichols, 57, Hoyack, found dead in flat on August 9. Maxine Davidson, 51, Plymouth, shot dead by her own son, Jake Davidson, on August 12. Katie Shepherd, 66, Plymouth, Plymouth, also shot dead by Jake Davidson on August 12. Bella Nicandro, 76, Notting Hill, stabbed to death at her home on August 14. Eileen Barrett, 50, Leeds, found seriously injured at home and died on scene on August 15. Sharon Pickles, 45, Westminster, found dead with slashed throat on August 19. Helen Anderson, 50, 41, Guildford, found dead in undergrowth beside a slip road on August 23. Jade Ward, 27, shot in North Wales, found dead in a house on August 26. Maddie Durrant, Hollenby, 22, Kettering, found that stabbed to death by her partner in a apparent murder-suicide on August 27. Fawaza Javid, 31, fell to her death from Arthur C on September 2nd. Ingrid Matthew, 54, Leicester, found dead at house on September 11. Sabina Nessa, 28, Kidbrook, South East London, killed on a short walk to the pub on September 17. Terry Harris, 35, Killamarsh, Derbyshire, found dead at a house alongside her two children and another child on September 19. Sukit Apol, 40, Wolverhampton, stabbed to death at her home on September 19.